Al Michaels, Jim Palmer, Fenway Park, Game 6. I thought Reggie Jackson summed it up brilliantly when he said the pressure is still on Boston tonight but would be on California tomorrow if the Red Sox win. And the other pressure now for the Angels is the fact they are minus Wally Joyner tonight and probably tomorrow night as well. He is still back in Southern California. Well, he's definitely going to hurt their defense. Not as much tonight because Gene Mock has gone with Bobby Gritch, who's an excellent fielder at first. But it does hurt their offense. Potent bat. Uh, the reason that the Angels are at this point in the season was uh, attributed a lot to, to Wally Joyner. So it's a shame. he would like to see a team at full strength. Similar to the World Series last mm -hmm. year, he would have liked to see Vince Coleman play. It's a shame that Joyner's not able to. So much was made about Roger Clemens pitching on three days rest. And he's big and he's strong and he looked very good doing it. But what about the wiry Boyd working on three days rest? Well, I think the mindset is that basically that, that, Bo uh, that Oil Can has not pitched with three days rest all year. But he can do it because I think he's been thinking about it since his last start. So he's, he, I think he's psyched for that, obviously, if you saw the film. Um, he's more of a controlled pitcher. So if he makes good pitches, and again, he pitched very well the other night. He made two mistakes. Both home runs, and it cost him, and it cost him the ball game. I would think Kirk McCaskill of the Angels is hopeful that he can start tonight's game where he picked up in about the third inning in his last start here last Wednesday. Well, he said he was very nervous, and uh, I think you could see it. But historically over the season, earn run average the first three innings is almost like five runs a game, and then he settles down. So second start, I would think he would channel some of that energy. He said the energy was going in the wrong direction, has outstanding stuff. If he makes good pitches, he can be very tough. Just to quickly, what's your thought right now? The way Donnie Moore pitched the other day, and we know his shoulder is hurting, and the way Doug Corbett pitched the other night, do you think Mock might try to close if he has to close with Corbett? I think that we will probably see Corbett, and I really think that uh, what Boston has done because of Chiraldi's good effort is reestablish their bullpen. I think he has a lot of confidence. Okay. Boston against California, a good man, and one of those looking on tonight at Fenway Park, and there's the California lineup tonight. Pettis, Jones, Downing. Jackson, DeSensei, Schofield, and then Gritch, Wilfong, and Boone. And here we go. Game six at Fenway Park on what's turned out to be an almost summer-like night. It is dry after a very wet morning, a heavy downpour, a very cloudy day, but humid and warm. It feels like it's about 75. Gary Pettis to lead things off. Missing outside. It's the kind of weather that neither favor, favors the pitcher or the hitter. You look at the year that Dennis Oil Can Boyd had. 11 and 4, then lost two right before the All Star game. Yeah. Look at the first strike, then was suspended. Came back with three starts, struggled. Earned run average of almost six runs per game. Then was 5 and 1 until he pitched the other night. Again, one of the players that caused him the most trouble was Gary Pettis. He's hit two home runs off him on changeups. So he's let's see how he pitches. Maybe with a little more fastballs tonight. Inside. Two and one the count. Pettis hitting one homer off Boyd in the regular season and then the other one coming in game three. Rich Garcia works the plate. Larry Barnett at first. Larry McCoy at second. Terry Cooney umpiring at third. Nick Bremigan down the line and left. And Rocky Rowe at right. And Pettis, it's a high fly ball to deep center field, but a lot of room at Fenway Park for the man, Henderson. Henderson is in the lineup tonight in center field, not only because of what he did the other day, but Tony Armis is still hurting. Armis injuring his ankle, crashing into the wall, and there are the dimensions at Fenway Park in Boston. Armis could come up and pinch hit tonight. He is available to play, but Henderson gets the start in center. Jones batting second tonight. And Oil Can Boyd starts him with a breaking ball missing low, ball one. One and go the count. The Angels using their sixth different lineup. So Rupert, who has led off, who has hit well down in the order during the season, Backs in the number two spot tonight, and a lot of the maneuvering because of the absence of Wally Joyner in there. One and one. Well, and that and the fact that Pettis is having such an outstanding series, both left-handed and right-handed, a switch hitter. So with his base-stealing abilities, you like to get him up on top when he's hitting. Well over 500 and 547 from the left time with left-handed side, which is the way he's going to be facing the can tonight. 
One out, base is empty in the top of the first inning. If we go to a seventh game, that's tomorrow night. It would start at 8 Eastern time. And it would be Roger Clemens for Boston and John Candelaria for California. Good fastball. One and two. Well, he's very sneaky, Al, and it has the two fastballs. If you watched the game this afternoon, you saw Nolan Ryan with an outstanding performance. Nine innings, 12 strikeouts. Not as overpowering as Ryan, but does turn one over like Nolan. Good curveball, a little bit of a screwball, and also an excellent slider that he'll throw a lot of the times to right-handers. Two and two. Control pitcher under two walks per game. I would think, though, tonight with only three days rest, that's what would maybe indicate he's a little bit off, is you just see the ball miss outside. Tried for the outside corner, and Gedman with a real good look for Richie Garcia, but the ball was just outside. Still two and two. Facial expressions tell you a few things. With Oil Can Boyd, you watched him the other night. He is like a volcano on the mound, and yet tonight, slightly more pensive. And again, everything is relative. He's taking a little bit more time, and you can tell he's been talked to by Bill Fisher, by John McNamara. Stay within yourself. And that's fouled straight back, just above us. Two and two the count. Well, that's something they've been trying to and he's really done well over the second half of the season the other night he gave up one run and if you saw the film in the opening that was after he gave up one run not after the two home runs in the seventh inning but his answer is well that's the way I am and John says I don't think that's the best way for you to be and he's really worked on it and he's been successful the second half of the season that's foul away again it's not that they want him to be any less competitive of course it's a it's a case of just realizing where you are and staying in control and you watched him come out of the gate the other night very intense you read it on his face and now as I say taking taking far more time between pitchers in the first inning tonight than he did in game three Reggie and Mock and behind them to Is that an intense face mm. Mr. Mock still two and two if you're wondering about Mock I talked to Gene before the game. He is very optimistic. Very, he's a realist. And you might say, well, everybody's going to be optimistic or at least show that side of them. He truly was. He really feels they're going to win the game tonight. Reggie talked a little bit about the second guessing. He did everything that he should have done as a manager the other day. And his job as a manager is to get the players in the proper positions. Then they have to do the job. Weber foul, two balls, two strikes. Well, that's that little changeup, the ball he turns over. And again, uh, I think if you want to analyze the strengths of Oil Can Boyd, he's sneaky fast, as they say, very similar to Kirk McCaskill. McCaskill maybe a couple of miles more per hour. Screw ball, the curve ball, but above all, excellent control. Three and two, a field, no. That's Terry Cooney making the call at third. There's a change up turned over. Does Rupert go? Very close. Again, the best shot is the third base umpire. He has the best angle. If he goes, if the bat goes out in front of home plate, it's supposed to be called strike three. And with the pitch in the dirt, Rich Garcia examines it at the suggestion of Jones and keeps it in play. Three and two. One out, base is empty, top of the first inning. Game six at Fenway Park. He's on. So Jones fouls off enough pitches to work the walk from Oil Can Boyd. The Angels have the game's first base runner, and Brian Downing comes to the plate. Brian Downing. Already something Downing. very uncharacteristic of Oil Can, a walk. As we said, under two at 1.9 per nine innings all season. And that's something you really can't afford to do up here in Fenway Park. There's one weakness that Oil Can has. It's the home run ball. Then again, uh, that's what did him in in the seventh inning in the third game. 
solo home run on a hanging slider by Schofield, a hanging high changeup that Pettis drilled into right field for a two-run home run. Downing with Jones at first base, takes high, ball one. One and other count. It's funny, I mean, there were so many things that happened in Sunday's game, for those of you who saw it, and then for those of you who only saw highlights, there were so many highlights just in watching the Sunday night shows and what took place yesterday. Among those that were left on the edit room floor was Downing's great catch. In there, one and one. As great as that catch, the, the truly significant thing about it was it kept him in the game. As you said, Downing over his head into the wall like a linebacker. It's nothing new if you're an Angel fan and you've seen him play. Exceptional year in every sense except for batting average, 20 home runs, 95 RBIs, walked 90 times. One and two. And again, we mentioned the story the other day, and maybe it's worth repeating when you saw what Downing did the other day. He's the man who went on the disabled list after his first pitch in the major leagues. He went after a foul pop so hard, hurt himself to the extent he was on the disabled list for two months. One pitch. him a screwball then another fastball right here so we call sneaky quick just doesn't get to it that's high gas they call it 91 miles per hour downing couldn't catch up with it but once you do that and once a hitter in the dugout sees that it established the fastball really all night for for royal can good fastball hitter you throw it right by him it says wait wait a minute get your attention reggie jackson now One and oh the count. And that's quite a mark to break. Again, we mentioned with Barra's record, Yogi's mark acquired through the course of only World Series games. Reggie has had the advantage of the added games to the playoffs. So yes, there should be an asterisk there, but still it points up the fact that Jackson has played on winning teams and has been very instrumental. Watch, this is a good pitch right at the knees. Well, can't disturb, he doesn't get the strike. And uh, Marty Barrett comes in to try to get him to cool down. And again, he's a very emotional guy. You, you want the strike, but you can't let it affect you. Two and one. And Reggie almost looking back and saying something along the lines of, was that to get even for the second pitch? Well, Reggie's only two for 17 with only ball four balls in the air. And what they've done is pitch him up. And he's told us in the first uh, first interview, I have to lay off that pitch. He hasn't been able to do that. Two and two. Neither club getting any productivity out of the cleanup spot. The Angel cleanup hitters, Jackson and DeSensei, in the five games are four for 21. And Rice on the other side is four for 22. Two down, Jones at first base. And Jones goes as Jackson drills it toward the gap in left center field. And Rice will have to play it off the fence. And Jones, who was running on the pitch, will score on a double by Jackson. And so Mock sending the runner two and two, and that turns out to make the difference. With Jones going on the pitch, he's able to score, and the Angels lead one to nothing. What a calculated play, but then again, if you have a control pitcher out there, and you're Gene Mock, you know he's probably going to throw, throw a strike. This is the out left field look at the double off the wall. Rice and Henderson know it immediately. The only play is going to be at second. If there is one, Reggie easily into second with a double. one nothing California. Reggie Jackson at second base. Two down and Doug DeSensei at the plate.
One and oh. An important thing to note is that the only two games that have been blowouts, talking about the first Angel win and then the Red Sox, the eight to one and then nine to two, are innings where the other two, both teams have had big innings. So especially here at Fenway Park, you have to stay away from the big inning. You give them a run, just don't want to turn it into a three or four run inning. Two and the count. Another thing to note is this is a game that obviously is more important to the Red Sox than the Angels. If you're John McNamara, you don't go very long with your starter. Coming back one day short, the bullpen will be up early. And Al Nipper would be that man if they had to go early, as was the case the other day when Don Drysdale interviewed McNamara before game five. And John said the first man in would be Nipper early. And then, of course, once they got later into the game, that changes the whole sequence of things. Well, it certainly does. And I think a lot of people misinterpreted what he said. He was talking long, man, and then you get into the short inning, late inning type of situation. Chiraldi having pitched the night before, you go with Crawford. Did one heck of a job. Came in with the bases loaded and one out. The sensei to pop up. Gritch to hit a soft liner back to him. Strong inning. A run. And then Chiraldi comes in and reestablishes confidence. 2-0 oh on the sensei. Half swing foul. And the count is 2-1. and one. The interesting comment is looking at Doug is that with the bases loaded and one out, Gene Mock said, I don't have any place to... After the game and Doug popped up, he said, I don't have any place to sleep tonight because I bet my house. Not that I would bet my house. And the reason Gene Mock, everything he says has a reason. You have Steve Crawford on the mound. You have a fastball hitter in Doug since that He knows he's going to get a fastball. Crawford just was a little bit better. High drive to deep left field, driving Rice all the way to the fence, and that one's off the very top of the wall. Scores Jackson, throw to Barrett, not in time. It's 2-0, and just a few feet away from it being 3-0 on a Fenway double. A fly ball in Anaheim. We're not in Anaheim, so it's a double. Doug almost made the clo place close at second by watching the ball. I think he really felt that ball was into the net. Didn't take much of a fly ball. Another look. Little screw ball, but look where it is. Right in the middle of the plate. Right in his power. The pitch is really to the edges of the plate here in Fenway, especially when you're behind in the count. Long fly ball. Looks like it's going out. It almost does. Two feet. And DeSensei has now hit safely in every game, and Bill Fisher visioning the mound. So oil can has been composed. He has been deliberate, but... He got burned on the walk to Jones after he had him one and two, and Rupert kept fouling them away. He finally lost him. And then the doubles by Jackson and DeSensei, and the activity in the bullpen as Al Nipper begins to throw. Two-nothing Angels and Schofield having a very good series. He homered the other night off Boyd. To start the seventh inning. Interesting to see. Each year he's gotten better. Brought his average up. Outstanding defensive shortstop this year. Only 18 errors. 25 last season. So he's improved in just about every area. Good base runner. Along with Pettis. Is he really the only speed on the Angel ball club outside of Rupert Jones with 10 stolen bases. Dissensing at second base. Two down. Angels on top. Two nothing in the top of the first inning. One and one the count. This is the first time in the series the Angels have scored in the first inning. The starting pitching in this series has been very good on both sides. The starters have been routinely taking their teams into the seventh, eighth, and all the way as Witt did on opening night.
Broken bat bouncer to short, and Owen has no play, so he has to hold on to the ball as DeSensei stops at third. So Doug is at third and asking for time, and a little shaken up. And Schofield at first base. Well, the fans boo because there's no play, but again, another, it looks like a screwball on the outside part of the plate, except you can see Owen up the middle. Knows he doesn't have a play at third, nor at first, makes the wise decision and holds the ball. And essentially a little shaken up, flexing his leg. He's the runner at third. There's Doug. And another look. Bobby Gritch now with two on and two out. Takes a strike. Going one. It's a, just a breeze tonight. Wind, if anything, blowing out, but really having very little effect. Just a little ripple. Did you ever pitch at Fenway? Mm. That is a major storm if, you, <laughs> if you're a pitcher. Anything you blowing You want out. the wind coming in. And he's hit by the pitch. And so the bases are loaded, and Rob Wilfong is coming up. And Gedman's going to go to the mound. And so is Buckner. Again, you see Gedman inside. Talked about any if anything right. goes with oil can would be an indication would be control. We've seen the walk, getting the ball in the middle of the plate. Now we talked in the before the first, third game. He wanted to pitch the game of, the, of his life. Obviously, of an even more important game tonight. Doesn't seem to have command of his pitches. Too many in the middle of the plate, up in the strike zone. When he tries to make a good pitch, he's unable to. Rob Wilfong, who had the big hit Sunday in the ninth inning to tie the game, but who slumped terribly, terribly down the stretch in the regular season. 0-1. Well, in so many games, really what it sometimes gets comes down to is when you need an out and the right hitter is up there, you need to get him out. And this is a perfect example. Two hits for Will Wilfong on Sunday, but this is the out man in the lineup. And this is a pretty critical out right now for the Red Sox. It's 2-0 with the bases loaded. Popped up in foul territory and back out of play. And the count 0-2. It's critical because even a single means probably 4-0. And it also means you probably have to go to the bullpen and bring Nipper in. And Bob Boone is on deck. So Will Fong, the number eight man to bat in the first. I think if you were John McNamara, you really don't know what Al Nipper's going to do. He's a sinker ball pitcher. He hasn't pitched in a long time. He usually takes a couple innings to accustom himself, get the sinker working. So this is an extremely important out. And the 0-2 to Wilfong is hit foul sharply outside first. Still 0-2. John McNamara. In his second season now with the Red Sox, and again, he was the Angels manager in between the reigns of Mott. John managed California in 83 and 84. Before that, Cincinnati. Before that, San Diego. Before that, Oakland. 0-2 to Wilfong. Foul away again. Two out. Bases loaded. We're in the top of the first inning. Sensei, Schofield, Gritch. 2 0 California. 0 2 pitch. Still 0 and 2. Six straight strikes, 0 and 2 the count. He's moving the ball around well. Again, you wonder with the three days rest, he's really made some good pitches. Pitches that I would think normally he'd be able to throw by Will Fong in the first inning. Seven straight strikes and still 0 and 2. 
Rupert Jones fouled off several, and that set the stage because Jones got the walk. Doubles by Jackson and DeSensei. The infield single by Schofield. Gritch hit by the pitch. Bases loaded, two down. Eight straight and six foul balls. Sometimes it's extremely easy to get the first two strikes, but the third one. 41 pitches in the top of the first. That's the last graphic in the world McNamara wanted to see. Another. I mean, you never know what's going to happen in a baseball game, and it's very, very early, but again, this is a very critical at-bat here. Angels trying to break it open early, and Boyd trying to keep it very respectable. Just off the plate. One and two. Well, Cann's probably saying to himself, I know what happens when I make bad pitches. As you see, uh, the 0-2 pitch, he's right on the outside corner, a little bit off the corner. And Richie Garcia, the home plate umpire, going right with Rich Gedman. Popped up, and he's going to get out of the inning as Buckner calls for it, makes the catch. Well, they took him season with a mark of 357, and he compared this batting title with the other two he's won. Well, as far as all the adversity I've had to deal with this year, this probably means the most because uh, it took a great deal of concentration to come back from what I had and uh, uh, to come back and win a batting title after uh, the death of someone that's so close to you, uh, uh, that, that gives me all the confidence in the world for the years to come. How were you able to pull through that period, and how are you doing it right now? Well, right now it's a lot easier than it was in July. I hit 247 for the month of July, and and uh, baseball was very meaningless to me then. I really didn't care about anything. Uh, I didn't care about getting hits, and that's not weight box because the concentration wasn't there. And, and uh, luckily it came back uh, to where I could enable myself to get back uh, up to 357. And the Boston lineup tonight has the man Boggs leading things off. Marty Barrett batting second. And Bill Buckner hits third. Jim Rice is the cleanup hitter. Another of the heroes on Sunday, Don Baylor batting fifth. Dwight Evans bats sixth. Big day for Gedman on Sunday as well. He hit seventh. The biggest day for that man, Henderson. And Spike Owen rounds out the lineup. Angels outfield, Downing, Pettis, and Jones in the infield. DeSensei at third, then Schofield, Wilfong, and Gritch. Bob Boone catching, and Kirk McCaskill. Two years with California, and a man who really came on this season, it's worth noting, again, the Angels with good young pitching, and then augmenting that with good old pitching. When this season began, they figured on Pascal, they knew they had wit. They also were figuring on Ron Romanic, but he wound up getting farmed out, and then you had Sutton and Candelaria. Well, they also lost Stu Clyburn, 9-3 on last season, so... Very important pitcher, 17 and 10 last year, 12 and 12. Lowered his earned run average by about a run and a third a game. A one hitter, a two two hitters. Got hit extremely hard in the first game, as we said in the pregame. He was very nervous. Made a series of bad pitches. Boggs led off with a, a triple. Barrett double. Line drive by Buckner in the first game. Rice hit a rocket to shortstop. Baylor hit a ball off the wall so hard it was only a, a single one and one that's why there were some skeptics who said what was mock talking about when he said I've never been prouder of a pitcher than I was the other day they were talking about the fact he battled back from that and really settled down and kept him in the game and then that was the game in which the elements took over Gritch losing the pop-up in the sun and McCaskill himself losing the chopper in the sun line score surely but about about seven innings two runs and they would have been all in the first first inning so again one of the worst things to happen is early in a ball game for you to make good pitches which he wasn't and have them hit but he adjusted fastball curveball and changeup nothing fancy but good stuff excellent curveball saw it right there to run a count to three and two Boggs led the American League in walks 105 
And one of the reasons he did is that he's able to foul off those pitches. That's a rarity. You very rarely see him get under the ball and foul the ball straight back. Usually the foul balls are line drives or fly balls down the left field line. And he's on. Boggs at first base and nobody out. And now Marty Barrett comes to the plate. A gutsy pitch, you know, hitter, especially of Wade Boggs' caliber, is not going to swing at too many balls, yet you throw your curveball. To me, it indicates he has a lot of confidence in it. He wasn't able to throw it for a strike there. Boggs, at first, is no base dealing threat, of course. As far as base running, he is hampered now. Slightly torn hamstring and a bad knee and ankle as well. What a go. And this crowd very much into it right now, very early on. And Boone wants to settle down to Castle. I think they probably watched on television and saw what kind of impact the crowds in California had. Great fans here in New England, but they can be a little bit, I guess, sedate. They sit back and they wait for things to happen. And I'll tell you one thing, if you get a 2-0 lead, what you like to do is go out there, get them out, one, two, three, get your team up at bat. And by walking the leadoff hitter, I think you give the Red Sox a little confidence boost. And then you go 2-0 on Barrett with Buckner on deck. And time called now is Marcel Latchman, whose brother Rene coaches third for Boston, goes to the mound. Dwight Evans was saying, and it got enough play here, so the fans read it and talked about it on television as well. He was hopeful that the Boston fans would emulate the California fans, deafening over the weekend. Well, as a pitcher, though, if you're Kirk McCaskill, you want to keep him out of the game. The best way to do that is to get the hitters out. And I'm sure that Marcel Latchman said, hey, if seven guys behind you, they can't help you if you don't throw the ball over. 2-0 pitch in there. One reason I think the Angel fans might have been so noisy this week, and part of the reason anyway, is the scoreboard kept flashing noise, noise, noise. But that would... Uh, not fit in Fenway Park. For some reason, in a ballpark that's 75 years old, I think I'd fall on the floor if I saw a sign flash, noise, noise, noise. <laughs> Two and one. With Boggs at first base and nobody out. Two and two. Of course, John McNamara is not going to do anything like hit and run at this particular time until McCaskill proves that he can throw strikes. He's going to walk you. Why not let you walk? Once he's established himself, if he does, especially with Barrett, who's a great hit and run man, because he hits the ball so well to right field, you can take that kind of chance. Otherwise, with a pitcher throwing balls, just let him walk him down to first still two and two boy throwing 44 pitches in the top of the inning and McCaskill is off to a pretty good start in that department Still two and two. It's a very natural thing to get defensive as a pitcher, especially here at Fenway Park. You walk out to the mound, you look back over your right shoulder if you're right-handed right and see a massive wall. The bottom line in pitching is you have to get ahead of the hitters, try to get them to swing at balls, establish your pitches, and so far McCaskill really hasn't been able to do that. Three and two. So now we'll see about Boggs going. Barrett, good contact man, struck out only 31 times in 625 at-bats. So he strikes out about once a week. Of course, McCaskill did punch him out three times in May and two times the other day. And they keep Boggs at first, ball four.
first and second, and nobody out, and here is Buckner. The game beginning at a snail's pace. It's a first inning that's consumed more than 35 minutes at this point. But it's almost understandable in a way. Not only the tension and the pressure and Boyd trying to keep within himself, but we're coming off that game on Sunday. And it's like everybody just wants to be back together. Strike, 0-1. Buckner had to leave the game the other day, hobbled off, was taken out for a pinch runner. The treatment, nothing new to Billy. It's an everyday occurrence, and back in the lineup. He plays through a lot of pain and has throughout his whole career. Shot to first, fielded by Gritch, and there's one play and the runners advance. So Boggs goes to third, Barrett pulls in at second, Buckner is gone, and Jim Rice comes to the plate. Well, Billy Buck doesn't walk very much, but what he did was as good as sacrificing, even though that wasn't the intent. Jim Rice, and he is getting a standing ovation. And again, that's another of those plays the other day that never made the highlight reel. Rice going to the wall to catch Pettis' drive at the fence. Two feet higher, and Pettis hits a pennant-winning home run. Field back, he'll concede one run. Strike, 0-1. Also, I think a little bit of emotion there from the fans, too, saying to Rice, hey, you know, we know you're not having a great series, but we're with you, man. Infield back. And it gets by Boone, and Bob scores two to one. Well, no excuse for Bob Boone. I believe the ball really doesn't bounce. Carries, I think if he felt the ball was going to go by him, he would have scooted out in front of it. The ball he thought he could backhand. Almost in the dirt, but not quite. It speaks of what kind of velocity and movement the McCaskill has, but does score a run. Pass ball is the call. Two and one the count. So Marty Barrett is now the runner at third, and he's the tying run here in the first inning with one out. Two and one the count on Rice. And the Angel infield has to play back, so all it takes is a ground ball, and we're tied. And there's your ground ball. And we're tied. Two runs, no hits in the inning for the Red Sox. Two out, base is empty, and Baylor at the plate. If you're sitting at home, you don't realize good low fastball pitchers pitch. Rice, no dummy, looks at the infielders, knows the ground ball will score a run. Not selfish, he hits it. Are we on our way toward another Sunday ride? Again, I know Kirk McCaskill did not want to let the Red Sox back in the game this soon. Sometimes you can't always do what you want out there. 2-0. Looks like he has better velocity, but again, if you can't channel it and do what you want with it, you become a thrower instead of a pitcher. In this inning, he is throwing the ball, not pitching. Three and oh. Locke can only hope that history repeats in the sense McCaskill got off to such a shaky start the other day that he'll regroup. But the way this one is going with both pitchers, we may be going to the bullpen very early. If nothing else, because of the inordinately high numbers of pitches thrown by both men. Strike, 3-1. and one. 
Gene Mott. Three and two now. Two out, bases empty, game tied in the first inning. Two two. Not really see typical Red Sox Fenway Park baseball the first two games. A lot of runs scored, which can happen very easily up here, but a lot of times they're nine to eight, eight to seven, ten to eight. Eight to one and nine to two are blowouts. High fly ball, shallow left field, and Downing comes in and makes the catch. So both pitchers stumble at the best despite the pass ball in the bottom of the first inning. He can have quite an effect on each hitter as they stand in, as attested to by Dwight Evans. You can't tell how good this guy is until you run it back in slow motion. And that's the only way you can pick it up. He's so quick. You see a, a pitch that says, you know, you say, that might have been low, but I'm not too sure. Now you run it back in slow motion. You see him go down with his glove real quick and then come back up. And then you see the umpire call strike, and you say he caught it low and brought it up. He's the best at it. He's an artist. And uh, I don't know who taught him it. Taught him that. I don't know if they taught him that at uh, Stanford or what, but he is, uh, he's probably the smartest catcher in the game today. He's got a PhD in pitch framing. Well, it's not only that. When the hitters talk about it, they say you can't guess with him. He's constantly moving the ball around. Of course, the way McCaskill really exhibited wildness is real tough to really sit anywhere and, and develop any pattern, which is what you need to get those pitches. Boone to lead off Pettis and Jones. Boone having a great series at the plate. Nine for 17. Top hitter on both clubs. Breaks his bat, hits it down to Owen who one hands and gets him. Spike Owen throwing out Boone. One down here in the second inning and out of the top of the Angel batting order and Gary Pettis. Pettis made good contact in the first flying to deep center. Some of the Red Sox, no oh, questioning to a, a minor degree. The bats of Pettis and DeSensei, some wondering how Gary Pettis can hit a couple of balls as he did Saturday and Sunday so far the other way. And they were talking about DeSensei's double that preceded the home run by Gritch off Henderson's glove as a fly ball that traveled a little further than you might have thought. One and one. But it's not even a, a minor controversy here. I mean, when you're dealing with Mike Scott on the other side. Well, a lot of the <laughs> modern bats have a hollowed out end. Doug came out of the dugout with a cork in that hollow and went over to talk to the Red Sox today. He said, yes, my bat is corked. If you go back and even before that double, he had a double that really got Tony Armas out of the game. A ball he tried to catch in the straightaway center. He said, if my bat was parked, how far do you think that ball would have gone? Mm -hmm. I said, well, it never got higher than the fence. It probably would have gone through the fence. That's ripped into right center field. And Gary Pettis picks up his ninth hit in the playoffs. So Pettis at first base. Gary with his 50 steals and 63 attempts this season, but Gedman has been equal to the task on a couple of occasions. Four Gedman out of down. five. Good Attempted job. five steals. He's thrown four of them out. Pettis was thrown out in the first inning in game three, and then Gedman threw him out in the third inning in game four. Buckner holding him on. Jones at the plate. Well, can't look to center field. That's a, that's a new, new unique move. You come down, the runner's over your left shoulder. He looked out at second base and then backed over, back off the mound. Amazing. <laughs> when you have a tough first inning, sometimes you don't know where the runners are. <laughs> He's still looking over there. And it's hit down the line and hooking and going foul. Group 
Cooper Jones trying to play on a world championship team for the second time in three years. He was with the Tigers in 84. And that was after he had been released and had fought his way back to the big leagues through the minors. Two-two tie in the second. <laughs> A long look toward center, and then he calls time. Well, it is one thing you you can do. You can hold the ball a long time, which he did there. You can throw over there a long time. You can quick pitch to home plate. But the one thing you can't do is let it bother you so much that you make bad pitches to home plate because that results in two run home runs, especially with a man on. First pitch was a hanging screwball. He was lucky that Jones was out in front of it. Pitch out, not moving his pettis, and the count is one and one. Well, that's another thing you can do, and it's a lot easier to do that if you're ahead in the count. Just to concise what I'm saying is you 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 want it, you respect Pettis' speed, you know that he stole 50 bases. But really, what your main task as a pitcher is, is to get the guy out at home. Nipper is throwing again in the Sox pen. McNamara can't afford to fool around. A lot of pitches by Boyd in the first. Another look now at Boyd. Boyd slowing himself down so much and then throwing over to first base. But he slowed himself down that he has no rhythm at all right now, really really hasn't showed us he has any command of his pitches. The only way that move could be deceptive if he looks at center and then goes home. So far, he's just looked at center and then gone to first base. Now more conventionally, he throws high, ball two. Two and one. McNamara cannot be happy about what he's seeing with Boyd so far. But he also knows what's out in the bullpen. Mm -hmm. We talked about that earlier. Six pitchers that he does have in the bullpen, 450 innings, 700 and some base runners. Three and one. They did get a surprisingly good performance out of a guy who was lost in the bullpen, and that was Steve Crawford. And that's another of those little vignettes on Sunday that really got lost in the fireworks. The unbelievable job Crawford did with the bases loaded and one out in the ninth inning and then pitching the tenth. And Crawford wound up as the winning pitcher with Giraldi getting the save. Foul away. Three balls, two strikes now. Three and two the count on Rupert Jones. Well, he will be running here. You've you got to figure that Boyd struggling is going to throw a strike. Obviously, three and two. He's trying to. Faith in Jones. He goes, and it's hit down to first, and a nice play by Buckner, who crawls to the bag any way he can. That's one of those plays that you don't have a speedy guy on. You're, you're not on the bag, and it's a double. Here he goes off to get into a fielding position, but because of holding Pettis on, he makes an excellent play to... Keep the runner in scoring position to get the second out. Pettis at second base with two down, and Downing is the batter. Downing with six RBIs in this series, and four of those came in game one. The most important of the six was one in which the bat never left his shoulder when he was hit by... Geraldi's pitch on Saturday night that tied the game and Gritch won it. One and one. That's the first curveball we've seen. And talking to Mark Sullivan, the backup catcher, he said, You really have to call that pitch. You know he has an excellent one. He doesn't want to throw it. He wants to mess around with the slider and the changeup and the and the screwball really I believe realize that really an infancy of 
state of, as far as being a pitcher, how good his curveball is. One and two. Toward right center field, deep but playable. Evans. No runs, one hit. Had a stranded in second. At the end of an inning and a half, two. Evans, Gedman, and Henderson in the bottom of the second inning. Evans trying to get on track in this series. I'll talk to him about that. Really a very significant single in the 11th inning. Baylor got hit by a pitch. He hit a ground ball up the middle. And he said, that's what I have to do, basically, and not to make excuses. He said, when I come up with nobody on, and this is a perfect situation, so we'll see what he does. He said, I've been trying to swing for a home run. A little half swing there and a looping fly ball to shallow right field, and Rupert Jones makes the play. Right there, fooled with a curveball, but go back to that thought. He said, you try to hit a home run, and if you go back, and really, as you said, Al, the starting pitching for the Angels is look right there. Excellent curveball. Not much of a swing, but he's fooled. But he's been trying to hit home runs. They haven't been letting me. And the result has been a lot of outs. Rich Gedman. Perfect day on Sunday inside. Gedman was four for four with a homer. Bob Boone, his opposite number, was three for three with a home run. Our deck is Henderson, who was the big star on Sunday. But don't forget about Gedman. The sensei backhands and has a lot of time to throw him out. Two down, and listen to the hand now for Henderson. Well, they ought to be on their feet, because if, if, if he didn't hit the home run, they're not here tonight. great things about this game he dwells in, and toils in anonymity for years in Seattle and here he is a playoff hero high ball one one to go he said it so well in the pregame interview he said I'm just trying to make contact and I hit a home run and that's really what baseball is all about you don't very often I mean you really if you talk to hitters very rarely will they ever say I went up to home plate trying to hit a home run and you hit one you try to hit the ball hard and if you're strong Sometimes it goes out of the ballpark. Johnny Moore, I don't second guess the location. Two fastballs right by him, comes back with a split finger and doesn't make a good pitch. Let's get the bat head out. But Henderson, bottom line is he had to hit it and he did. Strike. By the way, if you saw his interview in the pregame and you're wondering, he said the whole hometown of Dos Palos sent him the telegram. Dos Palos is in California near Fresno. Three and two. idea of what kind of stuff Kirk McCaskill has three and one Henderson obviously looking for a fastball got it and still couldn't get to it three and two two down base is empty two two tie bottom of the second Does it the hard way? He goes from three and zero oh to three and three, and at the end of two, it's two two at Fenway. Rather easy to do to come back after the, the season I spent playing professional hockey. Third inning now with Reggie Jackson, who doubled to drive in a run. Jackson to Sensei and Schofield against Oil Can Boyd in the third. One and one. Remember when this series started and the, the little controversy just before 
the first game. What about Reggie's hand and wrist? And was it hurt punching the dugout wall in Texas? It seems like about a year ago, doesn't it? One and two. And Jackson, who was upset about one of the calls made by Garcia the first time at the plate, lets Richie know exactly what he thinks here. And those first two postseason home runs. Boy, you got Jackson off to a pretty good start, James. That equaled the uh, amount of home runs he hit in 15 years. So I, uh, plus you win the game. You throw three solo home runs that are unfortunate enough to win because your teammates get you five runs and you only give up three. It was a pleasure. Two blasts to left field, and then I uh, let Bando hit one even farther. You got to get him over swinging, Al. It's all, it's a psych job. Get him overconfident. <laughs> 2-2 two, two pitch. Got him swinging. Well, he established the fastball away, and it looks like he just turns this one over. Look at him run away. Reggie tries to go out. The ball drops right on the corner. Pitcher's pitch. Also, if you make that kind of pitch, you can almost guarantee that Reggie, with a big swing, is going to miss it. One out and essentially the batter. Doug doubled, and he's now 8 for 24, which figures to 333 in the series. Talking the other day about Reggie Jackson and the fact that even having a, a poor series statistically, he still gets your attention, the compelling figure. There is no louder sound for a strikeout than when Reggie Jackson goes down. Oh, you'll hear the fans respond in certain game situations when you get a vital strikeout. But just take your everyday, ordinary, top of the third inning leadoff strikeout. And the way the crowd goes wild when it's Reggie who goes down. <laughs> Surveying the scene. Five games, you get to be a pretty good lip reader. Doug says the ball's inside. It does look like Oil Can has established his control. Perfect pitches to Reggie. It looks like he's on the corners. McCasco certainly is throwing a lot better as far as command of his pitches. you plead your case pretty good pitch right there makes the umpire think they got him so that's the second out here in the third inning and he goes from has not struck out in this series to the past tense and the can has three K's we talked about the curveball Gedman calls for it Doug tries to hold up he can't hit it Again, it's one of those pitches that starts in the strike zone. You, you think it's going to stay there. It dips underneath the bat. Schofield at the plate. Reached on an infield single in the first inning. Strike. foul ball still 0 2 never quite seen that sign before two which normally is a curve ball sometimes will be very of course with with a runner on base and then the actual curve ball motion with your hand there's something that rich Gedman would not do if somebody was on second base
up down the line. Rice is there. Three up and three down. So the oil can now has things in sync. He set down five straight. We're tied 2-2. Fenway Park in Boston, a 2-2 tie in game six. And Spike Owen, the leadoff, 1-0. It's 2-2, but stick around because McCaskill's working on a no-hitter. <laughs> two runs, four hits for California. Two runs, no hits for the Red Sox. Base hit to center field. We laugh about no hitters with runs being scored. That's what happened to the Angels this year. Joe Cowley, the night he threw the no hitter against California, won the game seven to one. Well, trying to get ahead. You throw the spray hitters, the contact hitters, good fastballs, and Owen, who's been up 11 times left-handed with four hits after having really a, an awful time with the Red Sox late in the season, only hitting 143, is having an excellent series. knee high low and away and he gets a base hit you start to wonder and then it brings up this gentleman who is struggling here even though Al he's hit the ball extremely hard it's a deceiving 5 for 21 a very deceiving 5 for 21 for Bob it's over 200 hits four times for the Red Sox the impressive thing is when you hit 357 to win a batting championship and your batting average lifetime only goes up one point you know you've had having a pretty good career. Little squibber up the line. It is a foul ball. Foul ball. Irrelevant to second base. Foul ball is the call. Now again there on a chopper up the line like that, the call belongs to the plate umpire, Garcia, until it passes first base, when it then belongs to Barnett. The first base umpire. Well, Bobby Gritch tries to get the ball as quickly as he can, and right here, Rich Garcia has to, who has a perfect view, tries to get out from behind the runner, and you can see the ball's about six inches foul. Bobby's the type of player that tries to take every edge. Again, here at Fenway, you want to stay out of the, the big inning, so you'll take any out. Get the ball before it's fair. You know you might get a guy in scoring position, but you have an out. Owen doesn't run. He stole four bases this season in eight attempts. And he takes a conservative lead. The 1-1 one, one pitch is in there in the count. One and two. Breaking pitch hammered into right for a base hit. Owen will stop at second. The throw comes in behind him. Two on, nobody out. Right. This is a curveball. It's knee high. A little bit too much in the middle of the plate, especially for a guy that's won three batting champions. Head down. You can still see it still down. Rakes it into right field. Nice play by Jones, charged the ball and set up the really what I would think would be a sacrifice situation with Marty Barrett. And the Angels have to protect against it. The sensei calls time so that he makes sure he and McCaskill are together on what they'll do with a bunt. And again, as we've pointed out, in each sacrifice situation for Barrett this season, this is the type of thing he does so well. He led the league in sacrifices with 18. You, and this is where you really miss Joyner. Gritch is an excellent fielder, but when you have a left-handed fielding first baseman, he can come in and make that throw much more easily to third base if you're going to try to get the force. Now, normally in this situation, even though Barrett did go to first base the other day in a similar situation, you want to make the third baseman field the ball. Tonight in the 11th inning, Gedman with a pop fly bunt really in a situation I don't believe they really knew whether Rich was going to be punting or not he dropped one down because the since they didn't come all the way in I think the Angels right now are exhibiting it, the posture of having a defense set for the bunt so the since they no doubt will charge 
and he misses. He actually foul tipped it 0-2, and, and so Barrett, even though he did lead the league in sacrifices, laid down two in bunch situations on Sunday, and each was turned into a force at second, and now the count is 0-2, and, and DeSensei still wants to call time because it's not out of the total realm of possibility that Barrett could still be laying one down here. And DeSensei knows it as well as anybody, so it's not a case of just saying to yourself, I'm going to back up and play normal. And what he's doing, as you can see, is he's still guarding against the bunt. And he's up there to swing away and takes low. One and two. Owen at second, and Boggs at first. Nobody out, bottom of the third. Game tied, 2-2. Two -two. There are 286 during the season. 360 here in the playoff. He can swing the bat, so sometimes you'll let him do that. Also, is the type of guy that hits the ball the other way. So in many cases, you can advance runners really without bunting. Obviously, that was their intent here, but he wasn't able to get the ball down. One ball, two strikes. Again, Barrett even with two strikes after checking the third base coach, Rene Latchman. Getting settled back in. Toward the gap in left center and nobody is there. Owen will score. Boggs will be killed. Barrett has a double. Can't bunt, foul one off, double to the gap. 3-2 oh. Boston. Horrendous pitch right in the middle of the plate. They're playing him hit the other way, inside part of the plate, as we said. All winner, a strength program. Pettis makes an excellent play to keep Boggs at, at third from scoring, or at third and keep him from scoring. Not a very good pitch with two strikes. Really couldn't tell from that high camera position. I'm sure Kirk didn't mean to throw it there, but he did. Again, one of the reasons why Barrett had a great year, we talked last year, he down to 266, 300, 303 the year before. Lifted weights a little bit stronger. It allows him to get the bat head out. He did. Now the Angel infield coming up on the left side and back on the right side. You see where Schofield is. And then Gritch plays back at first, and Wilfong at second. 0-1. Marty Barrett with runners in scoring position. Mm, that's a fascinating way to put it, isn't it? Seven for eight, and everybody else is hitting 143. Really doesn't surprise you though if you I mean that's an that's an incredible stat if you look at Doug Corbett on the right looks like Chuck Finley on the left or maybe Gary excuse Lucas. me Gary Lucas. Lucas but he led all Boston hitters during the regular season 364 so he's really continuing at a much higher average than what he did all year for him which is why everybody says he's so underrated One and one. Very surprising in Fenway Park to, uh, I, mean, I don't really think, I don't guess Schofield you could call is halfway, but nobody out. Two run lead, even though it's three to two now, if you give them another run, you stay out of the real big inning situation. That's ripped to center for a base hit. Barrett will be held at third as Bond scores 4-2. Tries to throw a fastball outside half. Buckner just hits it exactly where he wants to, up the middle. Knows a grounder will get in the run. Pretty much a defensive swing, but something that Bill Buckner has done so well all through his career. It 
So 4-2 as the Red Sox erase a 2-0 California deficit. Fenway is rocking. Laxman is going to the mound. The loser of this series, of course, will go home for the winner. The winner will feel like they're on vacation at the World Series. I like Reggie's statement. He said, I like, I like our posture right now, but if we don't win tonight, tomorrow night, the pressure's on us. So Barrett is now at third. Buckner is at first. Nobody out. Bottom of the third inning. Boston trying to break it open, but it really takes a lot to truly break open a Fenway Park game. Keep that in mind. 6-2 or 7-2 here, if they get that far, is not 6-2 or 7-2 in a lot of other places. Right now, it's 4-2 Boston. Infield double play death as Rice fouls it away. 0-1. And so here, even if Rice were to hit into a double play, and he's no stranger to doing that, the Red Sox would get another run. subject that's been talked about so often last year Jim hit 291 27 home runs 103 or 4 RBIs everybody said he had a bad year because he hit into so many double plays 35 this year cut down on the swing a little bit only 20 home runs but 110 RBIs 324 average and he grounds it to third and Barrett has to come home on this play and get in the rundown as long as he can and the Angels do not execute it to the point that the tag is now finally made by Boone and in a Keystone Cop scenario, the Angels finally get the out, but also, even though it was not exactly what you would put on a videotape and show at a clinic, they did do what they wanted to do and keep the runners at first and second. That's because of Boone. Right here, the Sensei knows, can't get two. This is where the play eventually will turn into a Keystone Cop thing, but he runs him back. Now, good move by Barrett right here. Ducks right underneath him but still have him going back to throw in the tag. So one out and Baylor the batter, and the scoring is 5-2, 6-5-2. That's another key element of that play, Al, is that Buckner without any speed really is only taking one base at a time. So even if you try to get in a rundown, which is what Marty Barrett did, but you don't want to take yourself with Baylor coming out of a big inning, so Buckner stays at second. Two and the count. And in that situation, first and third, and nobody out on the ground to the third, the runner at third has to come home. You have to, because if you don't, the third baseman is liable to go to second for one and back to first for a double play, and then where are you? So what it amounts to is Baylor takes a strike is that you would rather have first and second and one out as opposed to man at third only and two out. Squib foul, two and two. Almost ran themselves halfway out of this inning 
And then Gritch, after cutting it off, throws the ball away. So right there, you see Billy Buckner holding up because he doesn't know if the ball is going to fall in or not. What sets this play up is that Rice does not look at Buckner. You've got to watch the runner in front of you. You don't see it from this angle, but what's happening is Rice is going back to second. Baylor with a big turn because he thinks it might be a double, and Gritch throws the ball away. And Boston leads it 6-2. to two. With Baylor at third, and Evans at the plate, and the infield has to play in. And when Gritch cut the ball off, he looked at second. Rice was scrambling back. Baylor was trying to scramble back to first. He knew he couldn't get Rice, or thought he couldn't. And he saw Wolfon go in behind Baylor at first and try to trap him. And that's when he threw the ball away. 2 and 0 now. talked about Wally Joyner left-handed first baseman would have made that throw a lot easier because he's standing in the right direction Chant of Dewey Evans nickname excuse me Gritch had to turn his body completely around take another look pretty good fastball at least as far as being away but up in the strike zone and again right here you see from the overhead camera Rice going back and Gritch has got to turn all the way around and hit a second baseman who's covering first on the run. Joyner would have been facing that way, would have been an easier throw. Good fastball in the count two and two. Boston six, California two. Still only one out of the inning. Two and two the count. Boy, Gritch has really been all over the board in this series. Pop up the other day, this play, then the hero the other night. Bring it to the count. <laughs> to center field and racing in and not getting there is Pettis. It's a base hit. 7-2. 7 to 2 and to the bullpen. Another look from above. Not hit very hard. But we said Evans, who's been trying to hit home runs, just trying to make contact and does. Loops it into center field. Adds another run. He wants the lefty, he wants Lucas, and the Red Sox have scored five and still only one out. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> I, don't, I don't blame you. 79 Cadillac Fleetwood, 83 Buick Riviera. Mr. Goodrens has the parts. Pontiac Fiero GT. Parts for virtually every GM car on the road today. Old Good enough to keep right in the game and... Carter wins it next for innings, and the Mets and Houston head to the Dome with New York a game away from the World Series. Meanwhile, here is Gedman, who was hit by Lucas's pitch the other day, and he rips it foul. Boy, is Gedman swinging the bat well. Now, we all know that you believe in miracles because you said it back in the Olympics, but you think that fate plays something to do in baseball? They bring in Lucas to get the one guy out, it's five to four, Going to the ninth inning with a 5 to 2 lead. And we're looking at right now the confrontation we had last Sunday. 5 to 4, two outs. First pitch hits Gedman right. Really looked like it got him up on the right shoulder. Lucas had not hit a batter since May 3rd of 1982. 322 innings. And we're talking a short reliever. 1 1 pitch is outside. That is amazing when you think about it, because that means Lucas pitched what would amount to, if you if you strung that out and said those were nine inning games, meaning he pitched 35 complete games without hitting a batter, and then hits Gedman with one pitch. Two and two. Really, considering the way he's used, it's probably 40 to 50 appearances a year, spread over whatever time span since 1982. Once again, Mock brought him in. He struck him out the day before, and he was failed to do the job. Oh. 
Down goes Gedman. So one out for the second out as Lucas gets his first out. And they hit around now as Henderson comes up. A good slider just breaks away. Gedman tries to go down and get it and can't. And that's one of the pitches that Lucas is, makes him effective is that slider away to lefties. A little bit of a split-fingered fastball and a fastball just tails away from right-handers. Henderson at the plate. 0 and 1. Mock with choices tonight. He can go to Lucas as he has. He's got the other lefty Finley down there. He's got Rule the righty. We talked about Corbett before, and you tend to think that Corbett could be their closer right now with Moore's ailing shoulder. Popped up. And Lucas will get him out of the rest of the inning, but a lot of damage was done. Nine men come to the plate. The Red Sox get five and half. Fourth inning at Fenway Park. Boston on top, 7-2. to two. And Oil Can Boyd, having settled down after a 44-pitch first inning, goes to work on Gritch, Wilfong, and Boone. Bobby was hit by a pitch in the first. 1-1. Again, a near summer-like night in Boston. Warm and humid. 0-2. The day beginning with an enormous amount of rain poured this morning early on. Then slackened off. Real cloudy day. But the field in excellent shape. To center field, and that one will drop in in front of Henderson. So Gritch tries to get the Angels started in the top of the fourth inning with a single. And Rob Wilfong comes up. Lays down a bunt, bunting for a hit, and it's a good bunt. Boyd fields, and no throw, not in time at first base, as Gritch advances to second, and safe at first is Wilfong. So Wilfong, and you're not sacrificing here, not when you're down by five, you're bunting for a hit, the element of surprise, and he lays down a beauty. Well, it's really bad baseball by the Red Sox. They have advanced scouts that tell you that Wilfong hit 219 on the year, do anything to get on, especially five runs down. If you're Wade Box, you really have to play in a third and take that away from him. What you've done is turn a 219 hitter into about a 500 hitter if you're going to play even with a bag because he can bunt 500, but he proved he can hit 219. So not a particularly good play. Very similar to what happened in the National League, Wally Backman. You know bunting is one of his really main strengths, so you play in and take the bunt away. And Nipper gets up in the bullpen. And this is not to tell you to keep watching, but this game is far from over. It is 7-2, but it is Fenway Park. Oil Can is struggling. Oil Can has thrown a ton of pitches, and the Angels would love to get into the Red Sox bullpen. And Boone trying to keep them honest. And the reason he did that is the Red Sox are almost playing normally aligned, and now Boggs has to come up at third. You don't figure to be bunting down by five, but at least you have to keep the defense honest, and that's why Boone did that. We talked about how smart Bob Boone is. If you do it on the first pitch, what it does, it brings Boggs in. If you wait till one strike and do it, then with two strikes, he just plays back. And Boone, if he does hit it on the ground, is a good double play man. Strike, one and one. talking about being a good double play man of course you're talking about that he does not have a lot of speed if he hits the ball on the ground and it's one of the infielders it's going to be a double play you're talking good for the defense yes <laughs> well in baseball vernacular good double right. play man means that I know you know that. Absolutely. one and two
One ball, two strikes, nobody out. Fourth inning, 7-2 Boston. Foul tip held by Gedman, and Boone angry that he chased one. Four strikeouts for Oil Can. We talked about getting ahead, 0-2. Just a little bit out of the strike zone. Boone tries to make contact, which he's been doing all series and can't do it. Now Pettis, who is nine for 19 in this series. box from that angle at third base and he's in there here because Pettis has such great speed no sense playing back at third this for a strike and the count is on two Rich off to his lead at second and Wilfong away from first Good curveball, established the fastball away, and then look at the big break on this ball. Pettis swings right through it. The curveball does it, gets you out on your front foot, and then you get a ball that breaks that much. Real tough to stay back. Did exactly what he wanted to do. Rupert Jones, he walked in the first and came in to score California's first run. Angels got two in the first. Red Sox countered with their own pair. And then Boston with five in the third. It's seven, two Red Sox. And Jones calls time. Hit down the line and right. Circle round, but he got there. And Dewey, Dewey, Dewey is the champ as Jones and the Angels squander a good opportunity in the top of the fourth inning. This is how you win eight gold gloves. Make all the plays you get to, and he makes it right there. 7-2 Boston. Spike started things with his leadoff single in the bottom of the third. And before it was done, nine men had come to the plate, and the Sox had Six hits and five runs. Owen looks at a strike. So Gary Lucas on and trying to keep California in the game. One and one. Interesting to see with a seven to two deficit how long Gene Mock will go with Lucas. Normally the left-handed short man. You do have to play game seven. You would think you'd like to have him ready, especially with Donnie Moore somewhat questionable. I'm sure he's out in the bullpen and will be, but he has had shoulder problems, which have been well documented all season long. I would think, and Mock knows it, and Mock has to manage right now, and he knows it better than anybody. He's going to manage tomorrow night's game as well as tonight at this point. And I'm sure he thinks he could still bring Lucas back for maybe one batter as it's hit sharply in the center field for a base hit. So Owen singles up the middle and Bodge comes to the plate. If we do go to a game seven tomorrow night, and as you look at the scoring summary here, 2 nothing Cal in the first inning and then Boston tying it. And then the five-run rally in the third. If we do go to a seventh game tomorrow night, it's Clemens against Candelaria for starters. 
And then, of course, in the game seven, everybody's in the bullpen. Don Sutton will be out there tomorrow if necessary. Mike Witt could probably give you a couple of batters or an inning. Staff against Clemens and staff. Mm -hmm. Hurst could come back and pitch tomorrow. Again, imagine that Hurst would was ready to pitch for one or two hitters tonight yep. if necessary. Right. Chopper to the right side. Wilfon goes to second for the out. Schofield stayed on the bag, and Owen is forced to second. So Boggs is at first base, and with one down, we'll take a look at Marty Barrett. Marty Barrett having a great series. Strained his neck a little bit at home today. <laughs> he said his daughter made a funny move. He moved out of the way, crossed some muscles in his back. But apparently Arthur Pappas, the physician, the part owner, also the team doctor, took care of it. Said he had some irritation, but it should be gone by tomorrow. Certainly didn't bother him on the double last Mike, inning. Mike Witt who pitched so well on Sunday. One and one. That was an, an interesting move, just another of those little things that happened on Sunday. And I find it hard, and I know Reggie talked about it before the game, and, and the Angels, to a man, really feel the same way. You find it very hard to fault Mock. Mock did exactly what he thought would work out. It didn't work out by going to the bullpen. It's funny, uh, Doug Krikorian of the L.A. Herald Examiner made a, an interesting point in a column yesterday as it's lifted in the air to shallow right field, and that drops to a base hit, and almost a force at second. Runners at first and second, and Barrett has another hit, and Buckner comes to the plate. The point of the column was that the crowd at that point had to factor into it too and if you leave Witt in there maybe the momentum and which momentum and the fact Witt wasn't tired would have carried him through Gedman. Except the same crowd had seen him give up a home run a rocket off left center field fence and then a another rocket to right field and as a manager what you have to do is get the right people in there when they're supposed to be and Gene Mock did that and his players didn't come through. I think Mock did the right thing. I thought it was a good well, play. He didn't do the right he, thing, but well, what he did was, you know exactly, what I'm saying. Exactly. Yes. I thought the, the, it was something that the, I hadn't thought about beforehand, the fact that the, the, it took the crowd sort of out of the game with the pitching changes. Because they had to go to the bullpen, and then you had to... And they, speaking of the bullpen, there's Corbett, who is not in a closing posture at the moment. More like the long man. But it took the crowd a little bit out and then in again and then out again and in again. Because Lucas came in and that took about two and a half minutes and then he hit Gedman and then another two and a half minutes when Moore came in. And then you all know what happened with Henderson. But one of those things is we go back to, to Sunday's game with Boggs at second and Barrett at first. So many things to talk about. We just go back to the early part of the game on Sunday. Remember when Gedman was at the plate, and Boone just barely missed holding on to the foul tip. Next pitch, home run. And that was long for God. Reggie getting picked off when he's only stolen one base all year. Mm -hmm. Sending Downing in the first inning with the Sensei up, who's really been swinging the bat well. With only four stolen bases, taking the bat out of the Sensei's hand. So you can go back in almost every game that's ever been played and second guess the manager, the players. But that's what makes the game interesting. Or at least discussable. Three and zero the count. In there in the count three and one. I am sure, and of course I hate to speak for the Angels, but having played it and almost gotten there, but not quite doing it, I'm, I'm sure over the last 48 hours, somewhere in the back recesses of their mind, somewhere almost every Angels wistfully said we were only one strike away from it. And they were. Three 
3-1 to Buckner. Hit to deep right center field, but Pettis can fly, and look how easy he makes it look, and the runners get back. That's a drive if you sit in the ballpark, and sometimes television can't really do a, a drive like that justice. When you're in the park, it looks like it's in the gap. And then the next thing you know, Pettis just makes it a routine put out. I mean, real routine. Well, the ball even hooks because Buckner slapped the last time a single to center. This time he hooks it into right center, but Pettis, again, very good defensive outfielder, won a gold glove last year, is playing over in right center. Gets a great jump on the ball, and I think the interesting thing about having pitched with Paul Blair in center field is that as a pitcher, the minute you throw that pitch, you turn around, and you never, ever see a, a guy on the move. He's already made that first move. Meanwhile, Corbett comes in this series, and it's the third time he's been brought in to face Rice. And when he was brought in to face Rice in game two, Rice took him into the seats. Two on, two out, as Rice hits a ground ball to short, and Schofield goes to Wilfong for the fours. So the Red Sox squander a couple of singles. It's still 7-2 to Boston as we go to the top of the fifth. In both staffs totally involved. The second times Clemens comes back with only three days rest. 134 pitches this second start here in the series the other night. Pitched extremely well, didn't get the win. Left with a three to one lead, a couple of guys on. Rice lost the ball in the lights or misplayed the ball, whatever the end result was, tied up the game. But Reggie really, he said it early on tonight. He said, look, the pressure's on them, Boston tonight but it would be on us California tomorrow night two and one take a look at Richie Garcia the home plate umpire and look how he'll basically rest his hand right on Rich Gedman's back reason for that he's really close to him inside protector American League has gone to that all the umpires use the inside protector now instead of that big bubble they used to call it so you really want to work with the catcher a lot of, a lot of catchers will complain sometimes that that hand will impede them when they turn to try to get back for a, a foul ball but an umpire of course the minute he sees contact he tries to move out of the way can't always do it of course Downing hits a grounder to short, and Spike Owen throws him out. So one down here in the top of the fifth inning. And it brings up Reggie Jackson. One four. Reggie Jackson. Well, this is certainly another chapter in the maturity of Oil Camp Boyd. Who would guess after that first inning, bad pitches, a couple of doubles off the wall, that he'd even still be out there. And he is gotten himself together, regained his composure. And again, I think pitching here all year is a plus. Off his foot in the count on one. Well, we go back to that first inning, and we talked about what a vital early game at bat it was for Wilfon, because Boyd was a pitch away from coming out of the game and a pitch away from the Angels maybe leading four or five nothing if he gets a ball in the gap and it's a whole other story but he battled Wilfong and got him and now he's in control leading by five oh and two the count Boston has been able to take Reggie right out of the series by making great pitches, trying to pitch him up in the strike zone, stayed away from his power, which is down. Let's see that swing very often from Reggie Jackson, a defensive hack. Mm. No balls, two strikes, the count. One out, base is empty in the fifth inning. 7 2 Boston. Reggie said it best. He said, they're going to pitch me up if I swing at it. I'm not going to hit well. And he's been doing that. They've been making good pitches. One and two. Saying you're going to pitch Reggie Jackson up in the strike zone is a lot different than being able to do that. Two 
two and two. its way back into the seats still two and two one out of the base is empty in the fifth inning at Fenway Park oil can Boyd and the Boston Red Sox trying to force a game seven on top seven to two Red Sox in the clubhouse and during batting practice Sunday in Anaheim kept talking about Kansas City last year coming back from 3-1 as Jackson grounds one toward the middle for a base hit. So Reggie with a single to center. And the Angels have a man on with one out and Doug DeSensei coming up. So you can use Kansas City as an inspiration twice, really, because last year, you'll recall, the Royals not only came back from 3-1 in the playoffs to Toronto, they came back from 3-1 down in the World Series with St. Louis. And for Reggie Jackson, it seems every time Reggie does anything, it's a new postseason record. 36 hits. And that's an American League mark. Pete Rose had 45 hits. And I guess I should use that in the present tense because you never know if Pete's liable to be back and has 45 hits in his championship series appearances. That's the Major League mark. Down to Barrett. Nice play. Boy, he does everything. He's a joy to watch is Marty Barrett and then Reggie trudges back to the dugout 7-2 Boston IBM player right here Marty certainly Barrett. was balls hit right on the nose gets in front of it make sure he has one plenty of time and Reggie tries to really impede the throw stands up more or less <laughs> throwing his hand and try to get in the way of the ball Barrett to first easily for the double play. <laughs> Don Baylor starts things in the bottom of the fifth inning. Boston on top, 7-2. to two. Baylor, Evans, and Gedman. Doug Corbett on in relief of McCaskill and Lucas. One and one. Don Baylor. And again, the numbers tell so little of the story in terms of what he meant to the team this year. Late spring training deal engineered by Lou Gorman, one for one. Mike Easler went to New York, and Baylor came up to New England. Two and one. Came up to New England and took over in the clubhouse, or helped to take over anyway. And that's one of the reasons McNamara was so happy about Gorman making the deal. home runs chipped in with 13 game winning base hits so not only a great influence off the field but on the field two and two and he's a guy who's played on winning teams but he still hasn't made it to the series yet I think you can directly attribute that to Don I'm sure you're not but similar to Reggie wherever he goes a lot of the, most of the teams win Ripped foul. Look out. Ooh. Ball skipping back up. Two and two. Baylor has been in four league championship series, but never to the World Series. And Bobby Gritch would be the same on the other side. So somebody will get off the schneid. Still two and two. Bobby Gritch and Don Baylor, former teammates in Rochester. Then up to Baltimore, room together. And then in California.
Two and two. And he gets hit. And again, nothing new. 35 times a season. All-time American League career leader. I saw him get hit to start the winning rally, but he'd rather get hit above the waist. Mm. But when you take it in the thigh or just above the right knee, or at least that seems where it looked like, then you affect his running skills. And hit in the 11th inning, started the rally that eventually enabled the Red Sox to to win on Sunday. The hit batsman. <laughs> you think about it in history, it hasn't meant too much, and when it has, it's always been because of shoe polish or or something like that. But there have been two huge ones in this series. As Evans fouls it away, you had Downing, of course, the other night when the Red Sox were a strike away getting hit and forcing in the tying run. And then you had Gedman, preparatory to Henderson's home run the next day. And then Baylor gets hit and scores the winning run. So that's really three times we've had rather significant. One and one the count. As Evans fouls it away in the count one and two. Seven runs, eight hits, and no errors for Boston. Two runs, seven hits, and one error for California with nobody out of the bottom of the fifth inning. And that's fouled away again. Angels got two in the first. Red Sox countered with two in the bottom of the first inning and then hit around in the third, scoring five times. Two and two. Okay, Doug Corbett, great game the other night. Sinker baller, occasional breaking ball, has to be effective, has to be a little bit out of the strike zone. Sinker that starts at the knees, stands up a little bit lower. I'm talking to him today, said, of course, I have to throw enough strikes to get them to swing at that ball out of the strike zone. Gene Mock's favorite sayings is he said if you throw the low ball hitters low fastballs or low sinkers just throw them a little bit lower than where they want it. If you throw the high ball hitters high balls just throw them a little bit higher than. Of course you still have to establish the strike zone. Corbett the other night was fantastic. Two and two on Evans who backs away. The game with an extraordinarily long first inning is now well over the two-hour mark in the fifth as Evans gets a base hit in the left field and Baylor pulls in a second as Downing returns it. So runners at first and second with nobody out and Rich Gedman coming to the plate. Gedman has grounded out and struck out and we can tell you that tomorrow Mets Astros Keith Jackson, Tim McCarver, and the gang heading to the Dome. Ojeda against Neffer, if necessary, will be here at 8 Eastern time. Steve Hurd came up with a an unbelievable stat here, which is worth passing along. It's something you would never think about. In the history of baseball, in the history of baseball, through Friday night, there had been 648 postseason games played. 648. That's the World Series, the Championship Series, which started in 1969, and the one Division Series year necessitated by the strike in 81. As Gedman rips it into right field for a base hit, and they'll hold Baylor at third as the throw comes in and the bases are loaded. So they're loaded up, nobody out, and Henderson is coming to the plate. 7-2. to two. 
And Gedman rips it to right. He is swinging extremely well. Coming off a four for four in the afternoon on Sunday. Can you continue with Steve Hurts' staff? As we look at the throw, that's exactly where I was going. I'm not going to leave you high and dry. In those 648 games, no team had ever taken a lead of more than two runs into the ninth inning and lost. Never. And then it happened Saturday night, and it happened Sunday afternoon in Anaheim within 24 hours. And that's amazing when you think about it. You think of the great comebacks in postseason history, but no team had ever taken a lead of more than two runs into the ninth and wound up losing in the history of the game going back to 1903 in postseason play. Two and all the count. Chuck Finley in the bullpen. Infield plays in. Football-like chant. Three and all. but a run scores and the sensei thinking about two at one point and then having to settle for one already a couple of errors on the year or in the series excuse me right there kind of looking where the runners are knows he can have the double play if he picks the ball up but unable to do it Again, when you're trailing 7-2, to two, not to make an excuse because that should have been a double play. You don't want the run to score, so you want to try to tag third and maybe see if you have a shot at home. It simply scored as a ground out and an RBI. There's no error on a play like that because you can never, or the official scorer can never assume a double play. That's in the scoring rules, in there for a strike. So what may look as an error to some is not only because of the rules. Gedman and Henderson and the runners at first and second with one out in the bottom of the fifth inning. It's 8-2 to two Boston. <laughs> Owen looking for his third hit. Lays down a beauty and he has his third hit. A base hit, 11 hits now for the Sox. The only way that has a play is Doug Corbett. He's on it, unable to make it. Once again, seems to be looking up before he gets the ball in his hand. And loads up the bases. Wade Boggs, bases loaded, one out. Already up for the fourth time in the game, takes outside, ball one. One and oh. Really sets up a difficult situation for Corbett. Down by six runs. He knows he has to throw strikes. It's not as effective if he does. Grounded and great play by Schofield to go to second for one to first for a double play. A tremendous play by Schofield who was going towards second when the ball was hit and had to retreat and somehow was able to come back and make the play. And you don't normally throw back to second base in that situation. Or does he misread the ball coming off the bat? Whatever, he'll have to answer that after the game. He turns in a sensational play. Schofield fouls it back, and the count is 0-1. What do you think, Jim? 
It had to be a pickoff. Down by six runs, Boggs at the plate. You have to figure, been hitting too many double plays, even though he did it tonight. You have to figure that the chances of really him not driving in a run are minimal, so let's get the second out with a pickoff play. Otherwise, I can't see him moving on, on, on any ball in that, situ in that situation. 1-1 one, one is popped up. Buckner, foul territory, one away. That would be a good little play. Pick the guy off Four. at second Four. base is loaded. That'd be great. Oh, you see that, what, about every uh, 20 or 25 years? Well, in desperate situations, sometimes <laughs> it's the only thing that works. Sure. Great. Gritch hit by a pitch and single. One and all. Of course, in that situation, Corbett just hit a batter, gave up three hits. It's the last thing in his mind is a pickoff. He's having enough trouble looking the other way. Mm -hmm. Gedman is underneath it. And now he comes into fairground, and Boyd, who was just an innocent onlooker. I mean, he was a bystander until the end. Well, he hung around the neighborhood, though, long enough to, to be in position to catch it. Again, it's a pitcher's dream. You, when you shag, you like to catch fly balls, but only if necessary. And right here, Fox doesn't thinks that Gebbins going to catch it, and Oil Can says routine. A will on second base. That has happened to me a couple of times, and the scariest thing is that when, when you shag, it's a little bit different angle than standing right around home plate, and a lot of times a ball will get up over the lights. Wilfong rips it to right field, the base hit. So Wilfong with a single to right, following a bunt single, and he's two for three, and it brings up Bob Boone. Great. Great. Bob Boone. That's Packer, hitting Packer. Boom, number eight boom. for California, three of them in the first. Oil can has scattered them since. The only extra base hits were the doubles by Jackson and Desensei back to back in the first inning. And another thing he settled down with his control. Not only within the strike zone, his only walk is in the first inning. Mixing his pitches well. Looks like he has good velocity. He's been around 90, 91 miles per hour all night. The most important thing is teammates have done what they really have not done that well this series which is to put runs on the board oil can Boyd a much quieter act tonight much more controlled act one and one and well, again you saw his history on excuse me out the other day close ball game one to one first run scoring and the, then the, the home runs it's a lot easier to lose your control when your team is not scoring runs. Grounded down to short and over to Barrett. At the end of five and a half, it's eight to two, Boston. Frank Gifford hung on him a few years back. <laughs> Mr. Univac, remember the that old computer about eight million pounds? <laughs> Barrett <laughs> takes inside ball one. That's too shabby right there looking at those numbers. Barrett, Buckner, and Rice as Barrett takes a strike. Most hits in one series. And Chambliss, and the difference, of course, is that Chambliss did it in a five-game series, and so did Lynn, because the league championship series used to be a best of five. And Barrett has put his name right up there. So Marty Barrett is three for three plus a walk. And 11 hits in the series for him. And it brings up Buckner, who is one for three. It's almost gotten to the point where you'd rather pitch around him, but very difficult to do that when he's leading off the, the inning with uh, Buckner, Rice, and Baylor, and Evans, and Gedman coming up. Oh, 
time you pitch against the Red Sox, you go through the lineup and you say, this guy, I don't, this is the guy, the one guy in the lineup I don't want to, uh, to beat you. That might pick out Barrett's name. One and oh. Boy, I'm sitting here in Fenway Park in Boston, and I mean, it looks like at the moment we're going to a seven, and I keep thinking about that ninth inning Sunday and the crowd and how crazy everything was about to become and how it was all stilled in the end, and here we are. And they know it all too well. Hand down the angel bench spoke volumes. Crowd with a wave. They're in a very happy move when your team leads by six. Well, something you pointed out is true only if the pitcher allows another team back in the game. And eight to two is not a safe lead in Fenway, but it is if. Boyd keeps throwing strikes and, and the stuff that he has. High drive, deep right center field. Pettis goes back, and it is off the fence. And the runners had to hold. Barrett thought the ball would be caught, so he's at second. And that's about as long a single as you'll ever see. And Barrett makes a rare mistake, but it's a tough, tough play because it's one of those parts of this ballpark of nooks and crannies where you don't know what's happening you got the jutting out angled and it looks like Pettis is going to make the play and Barrett had to wait he wasn't even sure after the ball had dropped describes it very well and you don't see that very often again we've had a lot of rain probably a lot of cinder because that's the what the tracks made of the ball just kind of kind of like getting a nine iron to a green just backed up and stayed there Meanwhile, Buckner comes out of the game. And Dave Stapleton will run for him and stay in the game at first base. In for a strike to Jim Rice in the count of 0-1. It's almost like he went back to first to tag up, which you'll do sometimes when you mm -hmm. think that the outfitter is going to catch the ball. And I didn't look like the ball was going to be caught off the bat, but Pettis is having such a great defensive series that I think it might have fooled Marty Barrett. And your inclination is when Pettis is even in the neighborhood, you think he's going to make the catch. First and second, nobody out. Toward the sensei, the second one, turned over by Wolf on two. And on the play, Barrett winds up at third. So two down and a little bit of a salute there a negative one for Rice Five. not much but enough fans here that enough to notice if yeah. you're Mr. Rice exactly you're Jim Ryan. that's amazing I mean really an incredible year similar to what happened in California I think fans are disappointed they booed Donnie Moore 52 saves nobody wanted him to throw the two home run two run home run to to lose the ball game when he comes off they give him a boot and his shoulders killing him three quarter zone shots and, and we uh, know that's it. the game though Baylor one for two been hit by a pitch fouled it away you didn't have to be a genius to look into Donnie Moore's eyes and face the other day to know that his shoulder is killing him and yet he's out there and he wants to pitch and they need him to pitch and he gives up the two homers and he stands there after the game and really takes it like a man another class act in the clubhouse well the mere fact that Doug Corbett blew him out of the county Excuse me, Al, that Doug Corbett is on the mound tonight indicates to me that if they go to seven games, which it appears they're going to, that when you need an inning or whatever tomorrow night, they're going to go to Donnie Moore. With two days rest. He needs that time between appearances is what it amounts to. Well, Walker made an interesting comment. He said he needs the time really three or four days, but he won't have that if they go to seven games. But then again, his control's off, so it's... Kind of catch 22. Give him enough rest to get his arm in a situation where he can throw a little better. It affects his control. Of course, the same fans that booed Rice when he hit the double play will be cheering him if he comes up with a big hit tomorrow night. That's just the nature of baseball. 
all sports. Two and one. Hammered foul, two balls, two strikes to count. Eight to two. Red Sox on top. <laughs> and Latchman flipping it into the fourth row. Barrett is at third. John Sutton made it, I, mean, I think, the most appropriate statement, quote, if you want to, about fans. He said, you know, they sit up there, they have all the privileges and none of the responsibilities. <laughs> Then again, they paid their money to have those privileges. I think the players understand that. You know, it's a little disheartening sometimes when you're trying to do your best and things don't turn out well. Two and two of the count. Got cool. Down he goes. And that's the end of the sixth. Eight, two. In the seventh inning, Gary Pettis leads off. Oil Can Boyd on the mound, and Dave Stapleton, who ran for Bill Buckner, stays in the game at first base. Two and all the count. There is Dave, who sent us all back here, made it official at least the other day, by catching Brian Downing's pop foul. Pettis is taking all the way, two and one. Even though he bluffs what appears to be a bunt, you're down by six and the count is two and zero, oh, and you're not doing anything but looking at it. Oh, no! Two and one. Three and one. Pretty remarkable performance tonight by Oil Can. Really remarkable when you think about it. <laughs> he nods in, in agreement the way it appeared there, but the way he started out, and he was a pitch away from extinction in this one, and he's brought himself back together, and right now he's pitched them into the seventh inning, and that's about all McNamara could hope for with a six-run lead. What a tough at bat he had with Wilfong. You talked about the importance. He had about six or seven quality pitches. Wilfong fouled him off and eventually got him to pop up. Little chopper to the left side. Owen charges. Gets Pettis. One down. And when you see the score eight to two the next day or whatever it winds up and you go not much of a ball game but again you go back to to that at bat in the first inning when the Angels had a chance to take a big lead to get Boyd out of the game to get deep into Boston's bullpen and that right now is a big big play he eventually got will find to pop out Rupert Jones is 0 for 2 with a walk right now is in what you would call a uh, comfortable state um, not much noise kind of relaxed savoring the game to this point they know it's Fenway and all of that but they still know they lead by six as it's ripped toward first and fought by Stapleton for the out two down Ball's hit right on the nose. Can is just trying to throw a strike, a luxury you have as he had to Pettis leading off the inning. When you have a six-run lead, you don't worry about any one pitch. So if you get behind, you try to throw something over. He was able to do it there. Jones hit it pretty hard, but Sable playing way off the line. You don't have to guard the line. Basic defense. Right to him. Oh, and one the count on Downing. Two out, base is empty. High fly ball to left field and deep, and Rice, hopeful of playing the carom, won't have that opportunity. Home run. Brian Downing 
hitting it just above the top of the 37-foot wall, and that makes it 8-3. to three. Well, the can, and One thing that hurt him all year was the home run. 19 during the regular season on the road, only 13 here in Fenway Park, and Downing just takes a high slider, gets underneath it, doesn't hit it that far, but far enough. Mistake, and he jumped all over it. Eight to three now as Reggie comes up with a single and a double, and he's two for three. Mike Witt in the foreground. Something to watch again. We talked briefly about it. Only three days rest for Oil Can Boyd. We have to watch him pretty carefully this time of the game. 0-1. Oh There's a decision for John McNamara. If you let him go seven, who do you bring in? Don't want to really use Chiraldi for two innings. You'd like to have a fresh for tomorrow night. Stanley pitched fairly well on Sunday afternoon, even though the result did not indicate that. I I wouldn't hesitate if a McNamara in that situation necessarily to bring in Crawford. I mean, Crawford's confidence has to be sky high right now after the other day. There's Johnny Mac right now. Probably has a five-run lead. Bill Fisher to his left. Saying, what do you think? Bill Fisher, of course, the pitting, pitching coach. Oil cans trying to make the decision easy for him. There's Fish. He's looking out toward the pen. And puts up the left hand, indicating I think he wants San Vito to get up. Of course, it might be a little optimistic, but John McNamara looking one of the starters is coming back, as we said, in one less day. He's thinking about a World Series, possibly, so you don't want to hurt his arm. Had done this all year. You get a three-run, seven-inning performance out of your starter when you put eight on the board, you have to be pretty pleased. Still one and two. Bob Stanley is in the Boston pen. There he is. Two and two. to right center field, but he didn't get all of it, and Henderson makes the catch. Got it up near the end of the bat. So Downing hits the homer in that stat. At the end of six and a half, Boston eight, California three. As we go to the bottom of the seventh inning. Evans is two for three. Down to short. Schofield. Going to first. Alan Roth points out a, a very interesting figure here. There have been 11 home runs hit in this championship series by 11 different players. Angels have hit seven. Red Sox have hit four. <coughs> Gedman, one for three. One and oh. Sharp grounder and off the glove of Grix. And Gedman is on again. And if that is scored a hit, and it should be, that'll be his 10th hit in the series, and it is. Done a great job for him. Four out of five attempted steals. He's been able to keep them from running. Bobby Gritch, really second baseman, takes the ball. He, and you saw the ball come up a little bit, hit the top of his glove. 
feared that Will Fong might have had it, but again, your job as a first baseman, and again, Bobby has played second base for years, shortstop, you go for the balls you think you can catch. Another example, though, Joyner is left-handed, would have been his glove side, natural glove side, much easier play for him. Henderson fouls into the plate in the count 0-1. Gedman is an interesting character as we watch Henderson foul it off again. And again, like Barrett, you get to watch a guy play every day and you begin to appreciate a lot of the things. And Gedman's having a terrific series. There he is. He's as modest as they come. When we do the interviews and you see the inserts that we run throughout the series and we do them before the series. Gedman sat down and it was funny the other day when I did Gedman, he would talk at some length about generic situations or other players or whatever and then almost not at all about himself he'd stop after five or six seconds and he came up to me in the clubhouse the day afterward and he said hey I'm sorry you know I just have a real hard time talking about myself and he meant it no apology necessary It's also one reason we haven't had too many Gedman interviews here. <laughs> so we'll do the talking for him. Good ball player. Two There's, and one to count. There's so many things well. Paul's a good game. We've been talking about Boone framing pitches. He really does receive the ball well, throws well, hits with power. Which you'd love to have if you're a manager. The only thing he can't do is run well. He can run, just not well. Three and one the count. He talked very difficult summer, three deaths in his family. Bad back most of the year. In fact, Winfield hit him with a foul tip the first week of October, right on the right shoulder. Didn't play a couple of the weekend games, yet was ready to play in the first playoff game. So as all catchers, really you have to be tough, you have to be durable to be a good catcher, and he fits the description. Three and two. One out. Yes, if you do remember the All-Star game, has a little bit trouble with a knuckleball. He's not alone. Well, as we said then, if, <laughs> if you can't hit it, why should your catcher be able to catch it? Edmund, you mentioned the other day, not even drafted. Grew up nearby in Worcester, Massachusetts. Had a weight problem early on. They talked to him about it, did the Red Sox, thinking about signing him, said, you gotta lose that weight, you gotta take some weight off, and he did. He spent a, a whole summer working on an ice truck. Foul to the plate, three and two. Henderson having a tough at bat here. That's twice. Again, the down in pitch is what Corbett wants them to swing at. Very injurious. Saw Boggs hit it off his uh, instep on Saturday night. No tangling this evening for that man. Just the box step. Three and two the count. Again, fouled away. Here's ball four again, but the, the ball starts over the plate. Well, Yuko never pay for a ticket, really. <laughs> long, long, long way out there. That is deepest, darkest center field. And he's on. So Henderson walks, Gedman goes to second. And up comes Spike Owen, who has very quietly had himself a perfect night with three singles. A reminder that uh, Nightline will follow your late local news, and uh, the guest tonight will be Secretary of State George Schultz. Ted Koppel will be with the Secretary of State, discussing, obviously, the recent summit. And President... Reagan's briefings at the White House today on Nightline. At the pace of this game, you better give him some coffee. 
<laughs> we can stay awake. <laughs> Owen at the plate. Interesting and discussion with, uh, excuse me, with, with Spike Owen. Uh, he hits right around 250 or so at, at Seattle left-handed and contact hitter. And when he came over here, he really struggled. 143 for about, I think, 43 games. That he, and he said, I don't want to make an excuse, but when you come over a different batting instructor, you try to make adjustments. And Walt Reniak, who is the batting instructor up here in Boston, has his thoughts. Been working with Spike, and it really paid off. Outstanding series for him. Got off to a very shaky start. Looked like he's throwing everything off his back leg. Like four errors in 43 games, and then in the first couple of games, a couple of hits, and hits it where nobody's playing. And he's four for four, and Gedman will score, and Henderson will score. And Spike Owen goes to third, and it's 10 to three. about working with Walt Riniak that somewhere down the road it would help him and make him a better hitter. Tonight's game is maybe down the road. Sinker in the middle of the plate, playing him around the left field. Pettis gets to it, but into third with a stand-up triple. Latchman to the mound. Latchman to the pen. Finley and Rule with throwing. And the Red Sox break it wide open in the bottom of the seventh inning and lead 10 to 3. Three singles and a triple. And Boggs, one for three plus a walk. One out of the inning, 10 3 Boston. Owen one. Finley basically a fastball, curveball pitcher. And the other day, Wolfong made a great grab on Box. Bring him in the face left-handers. Oh, and two. Barrett on deck. 93 on the gun. Started out the season at Quad City. 12 innings, four hits, 16 punch outs. They said, let's get this young man to the big leagues. Really did come up when Terry Forrester hurt his ankle, sprained his ankle. Northeast Louisiana College. Barrett on deck. Excuse me, Al, it's one of these rare young pitchers that seems to have an outstanding arm, but also the ability to throw the ball over the plate. So you can bring them in in relief type situations where you have to throw strikes. Two and two the count. In fact, he threw one right by Bob Boone the other day. And, uh, he said that he said he had that good of stuff. And he said, well, he has trouble getting the ball on the inside part of the plate, so I sit in. And he said, when I sit in and he throws the ball away, he's got such good stuff, it's, it's hard to catch sometimes. The ball's so lively. So not only good velocity, good movement. 2-2 to Boggs. Hits a short. Nice play by Schofield. And he gets him, and he holds the runner Owen at third, and that will bring up Barrett. Schofield's been playing so well in this series. Only one error, and that was base runner Boston threw his hands up. The ball hit off it. Looks at the runner. Comes in and easily throws Boggs out. Marty Barrett. Think of the two middle infielders tonight. Barrett and Owen are a collective seven for seven. One and oh. And they're the quiet guys. Remember, this is the team, and as you can see, he's got some nice company there. This is the team with Rice and Baylor and Evans and Buckner and Boggs. And then you got the two little pests who are seven for seven. Go back to the great Oakland teams. Everybody thought that Bando and Jackson and Rudy and those players are the ones that, that did the damage, but Campaneris and North just both could run. They got on base, then the other guys did their thing, just compounded the problem. In the air to right center field, and of course we're referring to pests lovingly, and they finally get one of them out. 
Ladies and gentlemen, the couple of runs for the Sox in the seventh. It's 10-3 as we go to the eighth and we'll be back after this message. Eighth inning, 10-3 Boston. The Sensei, Schofield, and Gritch with Bob Stanley out of the pen. Hello. Keep you on your toes. Well, his ball runs and he starts it way inside. Normally what he tries to do is start on the inside part of the plate. Doug with a little bit of acrobatics. Strike one and one. Of course, this would not be the time if you're a Boston pitcher to, to wake up California. Two and one. So many pitchers, instead of uh, throwing to the catcher, have a tendency to throw off the batter, especially a guy like Stanley, who ball, we said, runs so much. He'll run a good six to ten inches when he has good stuff. Funny the way the three games in this series in this park have turned out to be one-sided. And then you had the three in Southern California that were beyond belief. The short, Owen, he guns him down. One away in the eighth inning. And Schofield is the batter. Schofield, one for three tonight. This telecast presented by authority of Major League Baseball may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form without the express written consent of Major League Baseball. Al Michaels, Jim Palmer at Fenway Park. An enthusiastic crowd anticipating a celebration which appears to be imminent. A brief celebration because they know what's coming up tomorrow. Roller and Barrett can't get it. And that's a scoop. <laughs> He's gotten everything else. So Schofield singles into right with one away and Bobby Gritch comes up. You're right, everything Barrett's been able to get to, he's been able to catch way up the middle. Jams him a little bit, fights it off. You see him straining, just can't get to it into right field for a base hit. There, of course, shaded up the middle, playing the percentages, and Schofield really is an up the hit middle type of hitter. Rich. It's a little number to third, and that is a fair ball, and he gets him in first base for the out, and down to second goes Schofield. So two down, and Rob Wolfong coming up with Schofield now at second. The box has made two errors, and they've both been on double plays. Here, he knows he can't get the runner at second. Now, this is the mm. call of third base umpire. You see Terry Cooney call it fair. Boggs with a long throw. Great angle from that camera viewpoint. Look out. Whew. Everybody appears to be okay. Oh, no. As Tim McCarver said this afternoon, I hate to be a punch, but, but sometimes you have to pay dearly to sit in the box seats. Mm -hmm. Very close to home plate. You get a better view, but you better duck. A little scribble. Well, a good rule of thumb, if you don't go to a lot of baseball games and you're sitting in some real good seats, just off, let's say, to the right of home plate. When a right-handed batter comes up, look out. And if you're sitting off to the left of home plate, between home and third, watch out for the left-hand batter. And especially watch out if there's a hard-throwing pitcher on the mound. One and two. Two on Wolfon. 
Hit foul. Another wave makes its way around Fenway. It's late, and it's a one-sided game, but everybody is still here, savoring every moment. Two and two. John Candelaria, I would have left a long time ago because this is not something you like to do, sit on the bench. And I know John, many big games, knows there's a reason. Angel pitchers have not made really quality pitches tonight. Gotten behind hitters, ball in the middle of the plate. I'm sure he's saying tomorrow night's going to be a little different story. But you don't like to sit out there and watch your teammates get involved. And what we said before Sunday's game was basically Boston is not going to stay in the series unless they get some runs. They got seven and 11 innings on Sunday. Ten here tonight. Chopper. Nice play by Owen. And then he throws the ball away and throws it into the dugout. And so it appeared to be an easy end to the inning. All of a sudden results in an angel run as Schofield crosses the plate. And down to second goes Wolfong on the throwing error. E6. I don't know if we'll be able to see it from this angle, but routine grounder you'll see the play by Owen and it looks like Stapleton really doesn't falls down he took a look afterwards again if you're a left-handed first baseman you make that play easy Buckner's out of the game good angle looks like Stapleton after the play looked down to see if the ball didn't even look like it bounced one of those throws I think he anticipated to the inside of the bag and went to the outside bag and he didn't reach. Now Jack Howell comes up to pinch in for Bob Boone here in the eighth inning. And this is Howell's first appearance in the playoffs. And he chops it foul on the count is 0 2. <laughs> it's, it's ironic that he sets that mark on a night when he goes four for four. A lot of fours and his present. One and two. Well, that was not a great throw, but if you have a left-handed first baseman like Hernandez or somebody that can feel the depthly, just go to the outside of the bag and the inning's over. Stanley ready to hop off the mound. Two and two. little palm ball just running away and he way outside if you're a pitcher you want that pitch and the count now three and two pretty good message five pitches to Jack Howell four of them have been breaking balls excellent fastball hitter excellent excellent minor league credentials could be the third baseman of the future for the Angels. And he's on. So the score 10-4. Two on and two out, and Gary Pettis comes to the plate. And the Boston bullpen will swing into action. Four. Stanley has been the uh, whipping boy here in Boston for the 1986 season. He's a guy who did such a terrific job for so long coming out of the bullpen and closing them down and then it's always the case and Boston is really no different from a lot of other towns but all of a sudden the guy does the job for years and years and then he can't do it or has a lot of trouble doing it you really come down on him and so it's Giraldi throwing and Stampedo in the bullpen Alvin the right hander Pettis, one for four. Oh, and one. Chiraldi throwing in the bullpen right now. It's Fenway Park. If Pettis hits one out, McNamara is no dummy. It would be 10-7. 
before half that Pettis will hit a single and the next guy would hit one out and then you're looking at a, a 10 to 8 ball game and that's what uh, John is aware of. He knows to play tomorrow night he has to win tonight. And there's a high fly ball to left field. And Rice makes the catch. The Angels get in Boone as we go to the bottom of the eighth inning. Stapleton takes a strike. Stapleton hitting for the first time in the game. Foul away. Broken bat, fly ball to shallow left field, and in there. And you don't see too many dunkers at Fenway Park, to left field anyway. So Stapleton with a soft single. You we'll always take a hit for a bat. That's what happened here. Finley all over his fist. And a big swing and a soft ball sometimes will result in an outfielder taking just that half step backwards. Looked like Downing got a uh, pretty good jump on the ball, but the ball just was hit so softly he couldn't get to it. And now Stapleton has been up twice in the playoffs, and he's two for two. Jim Rice hasn't hit the ball out of the infield tonight. Rice hitting in the bottom of the eighth inning. 10 to 4 Boston. Chuck Finley missing inside. Two balls and a strike. Two and two. One fastball by him and right here again. Here's my best stuff. Try to hit it. Jim was unable to do that. Don Baylor. Red Sox have banged out 16 hits. One and oh. The Angels in the ninth, Jones, Downing, Jackson. So many odd things about this series. Jim Rice having a, a poor series. When you look back at the six games, Reggie hasn't been much of a factor. Evans has had a pretty silent series. Armis wasn't doing much. Gretch had the one key hit, but outside of that, not a whole lot. Downing, big first night, and has kind of gone along. It's been Gedman and Barrett, and the Schofields, and the Boones, and the Pettises. Funny the way it's working out. Also, when they come out here tomorrow, none of that will matter. Yeah, That's the exactly. interesting thing about baseball. The third, the sensei over to Will Fong and back to first for a double play. With the Red Sox on top, 10 to 4. And those banners. Just punched up by 
Chuck Howard and Jeff Gordy are the ones uh, responsible for this delay at the moment. So the point has been made and the game will proceed. Rook, 0 for 3, plus a walk. 0 and 1. Just another postscript while we think about it to the, the game on Sunday. Funny the way the angle played up in some stories and stories uh, that you watched on television had Dave Henderson going from goat to hero. Goat, goat my foot. If he makes that catch, that's a great catch. He went from irony to hero. Well, the irony is that if Armas doesn't get hurt on the line drive by Desense, Henderson probably doesn't hit. Jones lifts it to left field, and Rice makes the catch. One away in the ninth inning. Downing comes up. That's one of the writers here in Boston called it a miscue. <laughs> yeah up there strike one one broken back pop up great catch by Owen he's fun to watch and he's having a lot of fun tonight. Well, led the American League in total chances. See why. Right there. Ball's not hit very hard, but one of the more difficult plays for a shortstop to make is going back. Reggie Reggie is at the plate. Tonight's game produced by Chuck Howard, directed by Chet Forty, our technical director Mike Blazo, associate director Robert Cowan. Technical manager Tony Bursley, unit manager Peter Grimm, telecom manager Stu Strelzer, Tony Tortorici, Chaz Wiseman, the assistants to the producer, and Steve Hurd and Alan Roth. Our thanks as always. Two balls, no strikes to count on Reggie Jackson. Fouled away. Hey, you've been around long enough. You decide for yourself here. Three and one. <laughs> to left center field, Rice on the move, but he'll have to play that one off the fence. Jackson is on his way to second and slides in with a double. And so Reggie has three hits tonight. Breaking pitch in time, ball one, one and oh. High drive to center field. And why not? It should be Henderson who wins it. One game for the pennant tomorrow. 